Hello everyone, we're back again with another critique video. Today on the channel we have Paul Saladino. I've done a video on Paul Saladino before, however it was a Patreon exclusive, so if you're not already subscribed to the Patreon, please go ahead and subscribe there to gain access to one week early uploads, one extra video per week, ad-free, uncensored, and with access to all on-screen references. It's as low as one dollar a month, guys, I think think that people can conjure up that money. So, anyway, today we're looking at a video that Paul posted called Food Quality Matters More Than Blood Sugar Levels. Of course, Paul Stelladino would be the one to post this because he finds blood sugar levels to be something trivial and something negligible, which is egregious and horrid, ghastly. So, with that being said, let's just jump directly into this because, well, it's 11 minutes long and these videos turn out quite long for me. It's a lot of editing. So, let's get right into it. If I can get this microphone to stay up. As you guys should know by now, no supplements need to be taken on a carnivore diet as you can derive everything you need from such a diet. However, this does not mean there aren't certain nutraceuticals that can be taken to further ameliorate inflammation and subsequently any illness, disorder, and disease one may be plagued with. One of the best products on the market, if not the best product in doing such a thing, is the flagship product to a company known as Cerule called Stem Enhance Ultra, which effectuates the release of one's own inherent stem cells from their bone marrow. When this occurs, this results in what may be perceived by some to be the epitome of regeneration. Now, I cannot under any circumstances circumstances claim any cause and effect relationships from this product and any hard health outcomes. However, one may speculate what they wish with this information. If you want to know more about this product or are interested in buying this product, as well as many other products from the Cerule company, please refer to the link on the screen now or the description below. Um, going back to the glucose thing, I, I've heard, um, I would say, very well-respected physicians, one physician in particular, um, say, I'm paraphrasing him, but uh, he's basically said, um, if I put a continuous glucose monitor on you, uh, you can eat whatever you want as long as your blood sugar doesn't go above a certain threshold. Asinine. Ridiculous. Lectins and oxalates are contained within plants and they don't raise your blood sugar. That doesn't mean that one should be consuming them and that they're benign or innocuous in any way. That is ridiculous. Whoever said that should be ashamed of themselves and should step down from any authority or authoritarian body that they belong to and that they are a part of. Of course they won't do that though miscreants, misanthropic miscreants. He has set the average blood sugar at 85 with a standard... 85 isn't necessarily good. It depends on who you are to put a normative value, which is an average, and say that that should be extrapolated to everyone and that every single person should exhibit that constantly is ridiculous. It's also contraindicated. You need a significant glucose response, not a spike, but a significant glucose response to surpass the threshold that one needs to surpass in order to allow the body to assume an anabolic metabolism for a temporary sort of ephemeral transient amount of time in order to effectuate the processes that need to be effectuated in the body within anabolic situations. Okay, so that's not even... <sighs> Anyway, discursive. A standard deviation of 10. Okay, so standard deviation of 10. But even that 95, for some people, people need to go up to 105 after they eat. Depends on who you are. It's restrictive, okay? And it's demagoguery. And that, that to me is just like... Uh, my my hair stands on end. I'm just like smoke comes out of my ears. And I think, what are you talking about? There's no attention to dietary quality there. Right. But Paul, you don't know what dietary quality is because you think that fruit and honey are dietary quality or are quality with respect to diet, which they're not at all. And we'll get to that. That statement, I presume, is that there's good data for... You don't know how to interpret data. Don't cite data predictive value for glycemic index, glycemic load of our foods, which there isn't. I mean, I've got an abstract pulled up. I, I'm sorry, what? See, this is what I mean by he doesn't know how to interpret data. The thing is, is the data you were about to cite, I would predict to be of the human nutrition science nature or of that same ilk, which isn't science. Human nutrition science, I've said it before and I'll say it again, is bread and circuses from the mainstream medical establishment with the intended audience being we the people. For example, there are no studies to inform upon the risk of any hard health outcome or the benefit, hazard, etc. of any food as it relates to any aspect of human nutrition over any given period of time throughout the entire time human nutrition science has existed. There never has been and there never will be because we cannot impose experimental protocol or protocols upon human beings. Therefore, we cannot establish a causal relationship between a food, let's say, and a heart health outcome being exhibited and presenting in human beings, positive or negative. 
we don't have those. We cannot do that. So when you say there's no real evidence for glycemic status or the glycemic load of one's food having an impact on their overall health, yeah, within that science, there isn't. I agree with you. The problem is you just said data. You didn't say data from human nutrition science. We actually do have data from other sciences that are real sciences, particularly biochemistry, something I'm very au fait and familiar with. Despite how relatively inchoate and incipient my knowledge of that field is, it is still vastly superior to yours. Someone that doesn't even understand the fundamental rudimentary levels of the Randall cycle. Something that's actually quite simple. Blood sugar response or the glycemic status or glycemic response after one consumes food is extremely important for, let's say, portending or predicting someone's health and disease processes or lack thereof that they will or will not present with. Because you see, the thing is, is blood glucose or glucose itself is vastly damaging to the human physiological system. Okay, Paul, you should know this. It is a six carbon aldehyde. It is an aldohexose. Say it with me, folks. If you watch my channel long enough, you'll know this. So say it with me. Glucose is a six carbon aldehyde. And aldehydes, even in vastly small concentrations, destroy lipid rafts, tear cell membranes to pieces, bind to DNA to promote carcinogenesis by causing mutations to it, and in a high enough concentration but still relatively low, kill cells outright. Anyway, let's continue. The 2018 study. You don't know how to interpret this, and I'm immediately writing it off because of exactly what I just said earlier. Human nutrition science isn't science. However, just because I don't like engaging with or engaging in child's play doesn't mean I don't know how to play it. So let's go ahead and look at this study. Unfortunately, of glycemic index and glycemic load for body weight, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Okay, there's a problem right there. No one's glycemic response ubiquitously is going to be identical after consuming the same food because every single person is different. You can't even dictate or predict what one person's blood sugar response will be to the same food all the time because that depends on how much sleep the person got the night prior, their hormone levels at that given time, their activity level that day. It's nonsense, Paul. There's so many confounders. There's a problem right there. But okay, continue. Uh, the last, last author is Joanne Slavin. And the, the conclusion is that a conclusion of a study, just so you guys know, is an opinion written by authors. So sometimes authors won't even get the conclusion correct. It won't be congruous with what their findings actually demonstrated patently to be. But okay, what did the conclusion read? I and GL, so glycemic index, glycemic ro lo load, have essentially no predictive value. <laughs> Within that study, what was the sample size of said study, Paul? Was it extremely low? Because you're notorious. <laughs> for citing studies with extremely low sample sizes, not even attaining N of 30. Just ridiculous. What was the sample size? What were the genders of these people? What were the ages? What were their activity levels? What else were they eating, Paul Saladino? You see, this is why you should specialize in an area of science that is actually unequivocal and unambiguous, that actually redounds to unambiguous, unequivocal findings. Hard sciences, biochemistry, comparative anatomy is another, but biochemistry most saliently and most relevant to this. This is asinine comes to cardiovascular disease or diabetes. So the thing is though, Paul, glucose once again induces damage to the tissues. The tissues will incur and sustain damage from glucose overload. This includes the cells of the epithelial nature, the ones that line the arteries and to a lesser extent the veins. We know that heart disease is an inflammatory condition characterized by hyperglycemia, leading to the oxidation and glycation of SDLDL and other LDL particles, okay? But also leading to a buildup of fibrous tissue. Look into fibrin and fibrinogen. I talk about that extensively in my book, Contraindicated, almost out very, very soon. A closer look and revision of mainstream health axioms that have perpetuated illness, disorder, and disease for over a century. Please buy that book when it's out. There is a lot of valuable information within that compendium there, that tome. It's not a tome. It's not that big, but I think a lot of people would like to read that book. So, uh, I hear people say this all the time. In other words, it's characterized by inflammation and glucose causes inflammation. Oh, my blood sugar went to 140 and they just get, they're like, oh my God, that's- Yeah, that's insalubrious. That is contraindicated, Paul. Even if that 140 milligram per deciliter glucose status or glycemic status lasts ephemerally and acutely, let's say, incessant rises of glucose to that degree and to that level will insidiously and perniciously cause and induce deleterious effects within one's body. It will end up not being acute or transient or ephemeral. It will start to be chronic. How do you think diabetes is caused? Diabetes being a disease characterized explicitly and exclusively exclusively by chronically elevated blood glucose and nothing else, hence exclusively, Paul. I mean, come on. Inflammation is caused by glucose, among many other things, and inflammation is a pre-programmed response within the body that occurs within the body when it perceives damage to tissues or a potential invading pathogen. Volcano, it's just so high. It's like, 
140 milligrams per deciliter is not, you know, that's not a sinful blood sugar for humans. That's an Okay, sinful is not the right word to use, but okay. So to speak, fine. It is deleterious. Yes, it is. Even if acutely. Do that over and over again, three times a day, every single day for the rest of your life. See what happens. Paul, the only reason why you're hedging against the amount of damage that you would be incurring patently from glucose and fructose, by the way, the exorbitant amount, the egregiously exorbitant and abundant and excessive amount of fructose you're consuming, even from sucrose, table sugar, or the disaccharide found in fruit, is because of the immense level of activity that you are engaging in. You are allowing your cells to oxidize that substrate more effectively than other people can. You have the privilege of doing such a thing, but... <laughs> Eventually, it's going to catch up to you because you will not be able to maintain that activity level and to perpetuate it. You are a dangerous fraud. Normal, physiologic blood sugar. Okay, stop using the word normal because look at what normal is today. First of all, normal is the 90%. 90% of people are sick and falling apart and succumbing to decrepitude early on in life and to a demented state. But even for the sake of your argument, it's only normal because we've been taught the wrong information, Paul. It is not indicated. That's what you really meant to say. It's indicated, or at least innocuous or benign, and it's not. We have the proof, biochemical hard evidence, that you dismiss and disregard. Consciously, by the way, it is a conscious dismissal, a callous dismissal of patent science, okay? It is not lackadaisically dismissed. It's not. A lot of humans should be getting after their meal, and so this... No, they should not be getting that false. They should be getting a significant glucose or insulin response. Really, we should be saying insulin response from an adequate bolus of protein in one meal, hence one bolus, which allows, once again, for the effectuation of anabolic processes in the body, like thyroid hormone production, adrenal gland maintenance, let's say, etc., etc. This this obsession with keeping your blood sugar below 110 as a, as a peak or a, an average of 85 with a standard deviation of 10 milligrams. Well, you shouldn't be letting it get to certain levels. I'm against putting definite numbers on things, sure. I think that there should be some variation. And we covered that in the beginning. But um, you're talking about spiking one's blood sugar. And you will have actually said in other videos that spiking your blood sugar is actually not only benign, but actually a good thing. Roll it. Some people may hear this and say, but won't eating fruit and honey spike my blood sugar? Yes, it will. Why do you care? I believe he said, so what? Or something like that. Who gives a sh**? Yeah. Sensible, cerebral, sapient people, Paul. They give a sh**. For me, this hurts people because it's- No, no, no. 140 milligrams per deciliter hurts people. Including you. By the way, we see it on your face. Even though you're hedging against a lot of the damage, the amount of damage that you've incurred within the last few years is, once again, to use the word exorbitant, but once again, patent as well. Too tight control. It doesn't allow you to get that postprandial insulin uh, spike, which you- No, Paul. Yes, it f***ing does, you liar. Now you've pissed me the f*** off. Yes, it does. Who are you to say that? 110 milligrams per deciliter, for some people, is totally sufficient and adequate for effectuating a postprandial significant insulin response to once again effectuate the processes within the body that require an anabolic state to be effectuated within. Which will what an arrogant, complacent moron. Accompanied by a glucose peak after your meal, that's fine, but... What you meant to say was spike, and that's not fine that you can look at a continuous glucose monitor and calculate glucose area under the curve, which would be some indication of insulin area under the curve. And this, this physician says that he wants to minimize insulin area under the curve. And I'm thinking that's the wrong thing to- No, that is a more auspicious approach to assessing whether someone's health is optimal or not in one criterion, might I add, because blood sugar response or glycemic status is one of a myriad of different criteria as to someone's health and what status that is. But yeah, look at the, look at this smile. What are the- <laughs> alacritously giving out misinformation. It, it's sad. This is a sad reality. But anyway, yeah, it is. What you're referring to is whether someone's insulin sensitivity is present, actually, or not, whether they're insulin resistant. And we can talk about that later. I wouldn't delve too much into that on the channel. Maybe we should, if you touch on it and expound upon it. I'll pounce right on that. I'll exploit your errors there, too. The apertures in your argument with alacrity. Speaking of alacrity. 
uh, insulin area under the curve is not what is causing metabolic uh, dysfunction. No, it's not what's causing metabolic dysfunction, but it's indicative of poor glucose metabolism, let's say. And poor glucose metabolism results from eating too fucking much of it, since it is not necessary, it is unnecessary and contraindicated. Before people come into the comments and say, poor glucose metabolism also results from not eating glucose at all, because then whenever you consume glucose, your body doesn't metabolize them as well. That's different. Context matters. In that case, that's indicated. You're correct. I won't be able to metabolize glucose as much as someone else does that eats it all the time. That doesn't mean I should be eating it. Damn, I'm fortunate enough to not be eating it then. It's indicated. It's called physiological insulin resistance and it has negative connotations. It's actually completely indicated and it's totally fine. Insulin resistance, in my opinion. I also think there's a- No, insulin resistance. We'll cover that. If you actually expound upon that in any detail whatsoever, even superficial detail, I will eviscerate it because you don't know what the f it is, Paul real misunderstanding in the communities and then don't talk about misunderstanding as someone that misunderstands everything you are purposely deliberately obtuse many times deliberately moronic what you do is you obfuscate things meretriciously in order to make things more abstruse for people and in order to aggrandize and adorn your ideology and the perception of other very impressionable people guess what i see directly through it and i am helping everyone else that's viewing my content see directly through it as well community that about the prevalence of insulin induced insulin resistance i think it's extremely that's not a thing really <laughs> unless you're injecting insulin in amounts that the body is incapable of creating on its own which people have done in order to effectuate greater muscle growth or something it's where the myth came from that more carbohydrates equate to more muscle growth and that's not the case because eventually when you eat carbohydrates your insulin response will plateau no one's really talking about that paul where is your head where the hell has your head been i think it's extremely rare in humans and we don't need to be as strict about about absolute levels of insulin. No one needs to do anything, but one should do something that is conducive and propitious to effectuating a convivial salubrious environment physiologically within themselves, okay, on a moral basis. And so what you're telling people is to do something that has been demonstrated patently and demonstrably, hence demonstrated, to be harmful, which is eat a bunch of f***ing sugar from the worst sources, arguably, fruit and honey and maple syrup. Oh, but as long as it's local. As long as it's local and spike your blood sugar to whatever level no matter how high and you're fine as long as your body is able to get rid of that glucose relatively quickly uh paul once again i raise the necessary query to you what happens when you do that multiple times in a quotidian fashion week after week month after month year after year seed oils aren't the only bane or scourge of our existence dietarily speaking doctor insulin area under the curve uh that we're uh, that we're sort of abstracting from glucose area under the curve so in my strong belief, it's fine to have a postprandial blood sugar of 140 because if- And that's why no one should f***ing listen to you, Paul Saladino. You lost your head a long time ago. The Paul Saladino of yore was not even sensible even back then. He was, in my opinion, insinuating himself into an ideology that was sensational to him and what he perceived to be auspicious to his own success and wealth. But at least back then his conclusions were okay. Are insulin silver lining because if you are insulin sensitive and if you have okay insulin sensitivity is simply a construct and a concept so it's hard to even say that because you can't get an insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance meter to measure someone's insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity it's based off of and predicated upon proxy measures such as fasting blood glucose and fasting insulin etc etc but let's just take that concept or construct insulin sensitivity is best achieved actually by abstaining from carbohydrates and fat together in a a mixed meal consuming such a amalgam of a macronutrient profile within a meal okay it's called the randall cycle and you pretend like you know what that is okay you feign understanding and once again it's demonstrable to any sensible person that you do not understand it paul you don't let's argue about it continuous glucose monitor what you will see is the blood sugar goes up and it comes right back down yeah and do that three times a day every single day weeks on end months on end years on end and see what happens once again deliberately obtuse the glucose area under the curve is very small <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah i iterate reiterate actually that to me this is there's not enough understanding of this and yeah you're right there isn't oh thomas fucking delauer here we go thomas delauer the most anodyne individual at the sake of being truthful and of veracity everyone knows those people that are deliberately inoffensive so as to not provoke dissent or offense with anyone in order to once again make him seem more affable genial thomas doesn't have his own thoughts in other words he's fake wrapped into that is what i was talking about earlier unless there is a central 
appreciation and focus on food quality. Yeah, there should be a focus on food quality, like the bereftness, let's say, or the destitution of carbohydrates within said foods as one criterion of quality. I don't think any diet is going to lead to optimal health for humans long term. And to be able to say to someone or to say, what did you just say? What? Appreciation and focus on food quality. I don't think any diet is going to lead to optimal health for humans long term. And to be able to say to someone or to say, I don't care what you eat, just keep your blood sugar below this level is that that is asinine. But your way of interpreting it and your conclusion is just as asinine, if not more. I mean, at least this person understands the deleterious nature of elevated carbohydrates or elevated glucose within the blood. You don't or you do. And you're feigning pseudo sophistication my or you're utilizing pseudo sophistication, I should say. Is is in my opinion. Like there's no yeah, focus yeah, on that's... nutrients, no focus on food quality. And this gets right back to the place where, uh, you know, the calories in calories out crowd um, says, but essentially that, that statement is suggesting that all calories are created equally. Well, technically every single calorie is created equally because they're all photons. There's no difference between them. See, you can't even eviscerate erroneous arguments properly. Ladies and gentlemen, Paul Saladino. And we know that if you look at just within fat molecules, whether you have an 18 carbon saturated fat, which is stearic acid, which we can talk about, or an 18 carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fat, those do massively different things in the human body. Those are both correct. Yes, there's some biochemistry thrown in there. Wow. Once again, though, in order to aggrandize himself, because he actually has a very poor understanding of biochemistry, a very superficial level of it, jejun and simplistic. But all he has to do is say something that most people don't understand, and then people don't think that. That's human nature. That's what I'm trying to bring awareness to, though. Teen carbons. Right? They're the exact same amount of carbons. They're, the, they're very similar molecules. They're just different by three or two double bonds, you know? And so yeah. that's all that's different. It's just a, a few electrons in different orbitals on the molecule, but they do massive- See that? See that insinuation of words that people don't understand? See, I'm familiar with this, okay? If you say that, you have to follow up by giving context clues as to what you mean, or by giving the definition of what you're talking about. I like to think that I do a good job of that. Things in the body because these fat molecules we know essentially have hormone-like effects in the human body with the polyunsaturated fat being linoleic acid, saturated fat being stearic acid, doing completely opposite things in our metabolism. So, all right, blatherskite. That's what this is. Rambling, tangential. We get it. I think that as a broken record, I will say we- How about you talk about the mechanisms of carbohydrates and how they're metabolized in the body, Paul? Oh yeah, you tried to do that, especially with fructose too, and you fell directly on your face, tripping over the pants that were hanging around your ankles. You see very clearly that the fructose fed group sees a rise in the fructosamine assay. If you've watched my videos long enough, or if you've read my book, you'll know how important it is to ground electrically to the earth. However, I am of course aware of the fact that this is impractical for many people, whether it be due to work or some other interfering lifestyle factor. There is good news, however, which is that there is a particular machine that makes water infused with hydrogen ions that, when drunk, recreate the exact same effects as grounding, without the need to actually be physically grounded to the earth. This makes it much easier to reap the same effects of grounding if one has no access to the physical earth or a grounding mat throughout the day. This water is also inherently deuterium depleted, with no trace of deuterium extant or contained within it. If you want to learn more about this machine, like where to buy it and how it works, please refer to the links in the description below. Focus on food quality um, in any sort of dietary approach as a human. And my goal with what I'm helping people understand is that if you can get to a place where you can eat as much of a certain set of foods as you want, you're going to win. And that- Wow. Why the f*** would you do that, Paul? If you can get to a point where you can metabolize cyanide as efficiently as possible and proficiently as possible, you're gonna win. Why don't you just don't f eat it because it's poison? Oh yeah, because you want to justify your addiction. You want to have an excuse to perpetuate that addiction. And since it's profitable because sugar is profitable, you want to make money as well. I believe that if you select those foods properly, this is a pretty bold statement, if you select those foods properly by looking at food quality and the absence of things that will destroy- You don't know what that is. Cover that. Things that will destroy your metabolism or break it. Like glucose and fructose and sucrose and maltose and sorbitol. <laughs> as much of those foods as you want, satiety will come and you will lose weight and become metabolically healthy. And No, satiety comes from eating protein and fat in the indicated amounts for human beings and human physiology. It does not come from eating carbohydrates that actively increase one's insulin and actively downregulate and decrease one's glucagon levels, if you didn't know that. See, fat is not the opposite of carbohydrates, physiologically speaking. It upregulates your glucagon, but it has no effect on your insulin. You've probably heard that before. Carbohydrates upregulate insulin, but it's not like it has no effect on glucagon. It actively down regulates it. So interesting, Paul. That doesn't seem very conducive to stimulating satiety, does it? It's good. 
Yeah, that's such an interesting way of putting it. And it's such an interesting way of putting it, guys. It's so interesting. It's interesting. It's intriguing. I'm Thomas DeLauer, and I love everybody. And every single person has a good point. Vegans, carnivores, it's all love. To give people something say, pragmatic, let's say people are... Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about pragmatism. Let's talk practical. I mean, CGM, they do want to monitor these things. You mentioned, okay, that postprandial spike in glucose is a, obviously a natural response. No, a spike in glucose postprandially after one eats is not indicated, not supposed to happen. That is a hyperglycemic crisis. We say hypertensive crisis. It's a hyperglycemic crisis. Even if acute, doesn't matter. Not good. Your cells are crying every time that happens. It does not want that. Like an insulin natural response. That was a little juvenile. That was a name. So do you think people should look at maybe what happens two hours after they eat a meal? And if they're still elevated and having issues then, then there might be something to look at. Look, if you consume carbohydrates, the optimal thing for your body to do is to have a spike, sure, and then to have an immediate, relatively immediate decrease in that blood sugar response. Sure. That is, I guess, a criterion of health. You could say if one consumes carbohydrates very seldomly or rarely. Sure. The problem is, even if you do that, that was still damage that your body has incurred and sustained or had incurred and sustained. Do not do that all the time. I'm not pretending that people are going to eat no carbohydrates ever. Very rarely do people do that. I did that for a year, a little over that. I still have carbohydrates. Hydrates, five to 10 grams a day. I'm not going to pretend like that's in any way salubrious though. Own up to your vices. Let's just put it that way. For me, for example, you just, you know, anecdotally, like I spike pretty high and a lot of it, you know, I, I generally do. Now I- That's a problem if you eat carbohydrate. I mean, it, a spike is not a good thing is what I mean. If you're spiking pretty high and you come right back down after consuming carbohydrates relatively quickly, well, that's better. Yes, no one's pretending like that's not the case. Don't cause the spike in the first place. Simple. A long history of ketogenic diet and a long history of intermittent fasting. That would explain why you spike pretty high. There you go. Physiological insulin resistance, which isn't a bad thing. Prolonged fasting, where I probably have a degree of peripheral insulin resistance that I'm- There it is. That's the other name it goes by, peripheral insulin resistance. Great. Been out about, right? And uh, I, I just don't get the concern. My fasting glucose is around 100. It's not the end of the world for me, right? And I try to explain that. Uh, when I- No one says that's a bad thing. It's quite good. Hydrates, I might spike to 140, but I do generally ostensibly, but I do generally come down pretty quick. Now, if I spiked to 140, and I'm asking you, and this isn't this isn't necessarily uh, circling back to what I believe or not. I'm just curious. If I checked two hours later and I was still at 140, then it sounds like that might be an issue. Exactly. You know, a really good way of causing that is by eating fat and carbohydrates together three times a day, every single day, every week, every month, etc., etc., etc. And C and C and C. That's a problem. You upregulate one's Randall cycle or your Randall cycle to a deleterious degree. The Randall cycle is always active. It's active right now. If it weren't active, we'd be dead. But it's not deleterious until it is actually activated, let's say, in every single one of your cells. Then it's a problem. You want to know the most propitious way of achieving that? Eating a mixed meal of fat and carbohydrates together in a significant amount, of course. Five grams, 10 grams of carbs with your fat, probably not going to do anything that much. Depends on who you are, though. Um, yeah, I mean, so there's a couple of things wrapped up in there that we should talk about, which is physiologic insulin resistance, which happens in a low carbohydrate state. Yes, typically, yeah. It has to do with the downregulation of GLUT4 transporters on the outsides of cell membranes when your cells continue to divide within an environment that is bereft of carbohydrates, exogenously introduced and externally introduced, sure. Which, once again, is not pathology. That is not an issue. That is actually the opposite of that that's indicated. I mean, think about it. Ancestrally, we weren't eating carbohydrates in any significant amount until fruit season. If your blood sugar spikes with a much lower dose, let's say, or administration of carbohydrates than it would with someone else that does eat a bunch of carbohydrates on a daily basis, Basis, that would cause you to store more fat with a lower amount of carbohydrate administration. You would store more fat, theoretically, with the same amount of carbohydrates administered to you, as opposed to someone eating the same amount of carbohydrates that eats them every day. Sounds to me like that was designed by nature to be the case, doesn't it, Paul? Especially considering the fact that fruit back then had much, much, much lower amounts of starch, glucose, sucrose, fructose than they do today, or than it does today. It was necessary for us to actually effectuate the body's assumption of a fat store storing mode with a lower induction of carbohydrates. It wouldn't be very productive for our bodies to have a more difficult time storing fat with carbohydrate boluses, okay? It's more productive for it to be able to store more fat with a lower amount of carbohydrate induction, okay? It is ancestrally and anthropologically consistent. Which is a really interesting discussion, and it's normal human physiology, quote unquote normal. No, not quote unquote, is normal. And it gets often conflated with pathological insulin resistance, which are different things. There you go, you got something right. 
completely different processes. Um, processes. It is not processes. High insulin versus low insulin in those two states. Um, and so, but if you're talking about your CGM, yeah, like elevation of your blood sugar after two hours is a problem. And I love continuous glucose monitors, but there's a much easier way to get at this issue, which is just get a freaking fasting insulin. Uh, I think that people should get fasting <laughs> yeah. insulin every month. <laughs> and in my opinion, this single blood test, which probably costs $35, would change the medical system, would change the horizon. Which I agree. I corroborate, Paul. I concur. Landscape. I mean, it doesn't change how misanthropic he is. I am referring to what he is saying, not who he is. That is what I'm bolstering here. Less than five micro IU per ml. It should probably be less than three. Uh, mine was recently two. If you don't eat carbs, you can get down to one. I mean, four micro IU per ml, and I eat between 250 and 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. So if anyone believes, wow. yeah, if any that is fucking poisonous. The only reason you are getting away with that and hedging against the deleterious manifestations that one would see and definitely will see biochemically speaking when consuming that many carbohydrates in a quotidian daily fashion like he is, is because of the immense level of exercise you're engaging in and the types of exercise you're engaging in as well. You are allowing your body to oxidize that substrate at a much more rapid rate with much more rapidity than some other person like a layman outside on the street to Day, especially the average American that has a job that doesn't involve being a health influencer. Someone like me, if I did that, oh boy. Yikes. Believes it's just this is my N of one, but I've seen it over and over and over. It's I've seen it all the people I work with. Oh well, I mean if you've seen it over and over and over again, then shit, man. Let me just throw my biochemistry out the window. <laughs> Paul's seen it, guys. It doesn't work like this, right? So carbohydrates do not cause insulin resistance. Carbohydrates and fat together is a very auspicious approach to achieving that concept or construct that you're referring to. Yes, it is. It's called the Randall Cycle. I talk about that extensively in my book as well. Contraindicated. Once again, please buy it. Um, not all carbohydrates are created equally. But Correct. Some are worse than others. They're all bad. To use a vapid value judgment statement, a very terse one. Glucose is the most benign out of all of them. Then maltose, which is a disaccharide, because it's a disaccharide between basically two glucose molecules. And then you've got lactose, and then you've got sucrose, and then you've got fructose being the worst. What are the most common sugars that fruit is teeming with and is replete with? Oh yeah, fructose and sucrose, isn't it? What about honey? Oh yeah, same there too. Good. Fructose is seven to ten times more glycating than glucose and is also inconspicuous in terms of its effects within the body, okay, because it doesn't register and isn't identified on an HbA1c test, something you tried to refute and once again fell on your face. This is what I was referring to earlier. You fell on your face with your pants around your ankles. You see very clearly that the fructose fed group sees a rise in the fructosamine assay. Um, a fasting insulin should be low. You can get a sense of how Agreed. fasting insulin is going to be by using a CGM. And I think these two go hand in hand. They really complete the picture. Agreed. But there's no need for a CGM if you're not eating carbohydrates or if you're not diabetic and have actually achieved or, or attained that status. Have you looked at the prices of CGMs? Has anyone done that? Just to talk to the audience here. They are immensely expensive. <laughs> a subscription to use one? Are you serious? the phenotype, so the actual way that your postprandial glucose looks, can also indicate uh, insulin sensitivity versus insulin resistance. And the pattern that you want to see in your insulin is a spike. No, Paul. You want to see an undulating curve. It should look like a speed bump. A spike is contraindicated and indicative of impending or already occurring damage. Excuse me, the pattern you want to see in your glucose, if you're eating carbohydrates in a meal, is a spike up to whatever, 130, 140, probably false. 50 is fine. False, Paul, misanthropic, dangerous information from a charlatan. You get to 180 or 200, that's pathological. Oh, well, you know, a really great way of doing that is consuming fat and carbohydrates together, which is something you advocate for on a daily basis. You make it even worse by saying you eat every 12 hours. Do you still play around with fasting? Uh, do you still mess around with it or is it not much of a priority for it's you? It's not really a priority for me. I would say 12 to 13 hours is my quote unquote fasting window, but 140, 145, no big deal. And then a quick return to baseline within an hour preferentially. And that baseline can be something that you understand when you're wearing a CGM. Um, I'll tell you that when I was doing a carnivore diet that was strict, my baseline fasting blood sugar was pretty close to yours, around high 90s, 95, 96. But when I added carbohydrates back to my diet, my fasting blood sugar went down. 
<laughs> That's great. Blood glucose levels vary. Okay, when did you take the test? Repeatability is very important to gauge with tests like glucose tests. How much did it go down by, for example? Also, in carnivore, you were having issues with electrolyte maintenance because you weren't eating enough protein. If you're not eating enough protein, you won't have as much of a glucose response, which means that no, not necessarily that your glucose will be lower than if you had carbohydrates in your diet, but actually your body can push more glucose out via gluconeogenesis into the bloodstream, perhaps. Also, not to mention the fact that if you're not eating carbohydrates, your body will do that to a higher degree. Glucagon will go up and will effectuate that process, leading to more glucose endogenously created or at least administered into the bloodstream. When you eat carbohydrates, your body can relax a little bit in that respect. In many other ways, it is not relaxing at all. What was your activity level back then? There are a myriad of things to take into consideration. You implied a causal relationship between those two variables. It's irresponsible. Oh, in the high same here, same here. What's that? Same here. Same here. Yeah, so my fasting blood sugar is in the yeah, same response. 70s now, or low 80s. And so let's talk about that other piece of it, because I want your audience to understand this, and mine as well, that if you are doing a ketogenic diet, if you are low carb and you reintroduce carbohydrates for probably 72 hours, you are going to have an exaggerated response of your blood sugar because your body- If not longer, yes. Just another sign that you shouldn't be eating them. 72 hours, you are going to have an exaggerated response of your blood sugar because your body is refusing carbohydrates at the level of the muscle. Well, I guess you shouldn't eat them then, huh? Man, I don't want that to happen, so I'm not gonna eat them. Great, thanks, Paul. See you next time, hopefully not. Why women who go low carb in pregnancy will fail. <laughs> you know, that is not true. You just used an absolute statement. <laughs> gestational diabetes test. And in fact, if you, you- You are vexing people based upon fallacious, facile, superficial claims. Get a grip, shut down your channel, reboot it if you want with the right information of credibility and veracity. You see, what you do is you trick people into thinking that your information is true by making it seem verisimilar, or in other words, have verisimilitude because of your eloquent articulation of topics that once again, you actually do not show understanding in, but to impressionable people, you do. That's simple. I'm not lulled by your nonsense sense fail uh you know a gestational diabetes test as a woman if she even fasts for probably 16 hours so, so it depends on the state of the body and what's happening here is really interesting oh it depends on the state of the body huh biology you and i had chatted a little bit about this offline before the podcast but our fat cells determine the insulin sensitivity of our muscles. The fat- Okay, that's one element of it. What about the number of GLUT4 transporters on the outsides of said muscle cells? What about that one, Paul? Cause see, you've now insinuated this little detail in order to, I suspect, insinuate your ideology that linoleic acid is the bane of our existence and is the only contributor of pathological insulin resistance, which is false cells are the director, they're the conductor at the front of the train. And when the fat cells release certain lipokines, which are like hormones that are lipids into the blood, they signal to the muscles to become insulin resistant. Muscle cells also have a propensity to downregulate their GLUT4 transporters when not consuming carbohydrates. That seems to be the more salient detail. Because see, those lipokines you're referring to, it also depends on what kind of fat is stored within those fat cells, whether they'll have that response or not, or effectuate that response or not. Depends on your fat status. How much fat do you have within those adipocytes? The quantity and quality of the fat determines this and influences this. So once again, you're using an absolute here. The term insulin resistant is confusing because we say insulin resistance is diabetes and- No, it's f***ing not. Insulin resistance is actually a symptom, not poor glucose metabolism. People like Nick Caputo have said otherwise and it's just ridiculous, it's facile, it's wrong, it's erroneous. The insulin resistance happens in keto and there are very different states. This one is physiologic insulin resistance, not to be confused with pathologic insulin resistance. Correct. So it's not pathological is what you're saying. Great. We're done here. I saved you this entire video. You could have just saved your time. You should have because you're wasting everyone else's. So in this state, when you fast, say you and I are out hunting and we're just gonna eat what we kill and we're not eating for a few days, this is normal human physiology, just like our ancestors would have experienced. Oh, it's almost like I said that earlier. We didn't have any fruit right now. We didn't find any beehives with honey. We didn't even find any protein from an animal. We're going into this fasting state. Our, our 
uh, adipocytes, so our fat cells, are going to release lipokines into the blood that are going to tell the muscles become insulin resistant, refuse. Potentially, but also, once again, since we didn't eat carbohydrates hardly ever, very seldomly, we also, every single time our cells divided, had a down regulation of the production of GLUT4 transporters on the outsides of those membranes, disallowing the body and disabling the body from metabolizing glucose as effectively as it would and efficaciously as it would otherwise, allowing us to store more fat for the upcoming winter, the hibernal season. Glucose, because we need to spare that for the brain, the testes, the adrenals, etc. In the correct now, that physiology gets going. It has momentum. Um, we know that when you're burning fat and doing beta oxidation, there is a tendency to want to continue doing that. That is not f***ing true, Paul. That is not how human physiology works. That is not how it f***ing works. You're referring to the Randall cycle once again, and you have misinterpreted that. That's not what happens. When you consume fat and your cells are replete with fat, if you dump carbohydrates in, it can't sequester the carbohydrates because it's replete with fat. That's not the body's tendency to continue oxidizing fat because the opposite also occurs. If you eat a bunch of glucose and your primary form of energy is glucose, your cells will be more replete with glucose, disallowing fat entry and sequestration into the cell or administration into the cell because they're replete with glucose instead. Misinterpretation, you have now evinced your misunderstanding and incompetence with respect to biochemistry. A very simple mechanism founded and discovered by Sir Philip John Randall, a diabetes researcher in 1963. You had a whole video dedicated to dissecting this paper and you fell on your face again. Products of that citrate, et cetera, sort of inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase and the other side of the biochemistry. And yes, also PFK1. Shall I show the graph on the screen right now? The graphic, the figure? I think it's uh, fatty acyl CoA molecules will inhibit pyruvate kinase as well. But anyway, in fact, actually, you're talking about pyruvate dehydrogenase. That actually, that comes later. That comes after pyruvate has been formed because it has to dehydrogenate the pyruvate into acetyl CoA before it goes into the Krebs cycle. So anyway. Vice versa is also true. When you're doing glucose-based metabolism, there are intermediates that inhibit beta oxidation and carnitine palmitoyl oil transferase. Uh-huh. Yeah, covered that. This is called the Randall cycle. The mitochondria. So our body is going to stay. There's like, you know, something in motion tends to stay in motion. No, Paul, that's not how it f***ing works. Wow. It takes your body a little bit of time to adjust, to come back online and say, oh, I've got some fruit. Give me a couple days. I'm back online. No, 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 no. You're saying online as if it's indicated for the body and normal physiology for the body to oxidize carbohydrates for its primary fuel source, which is false. It's been fat for four and a half million years of our f***ing existence. In your case, who are doing carnivore or keto, you'll come back online. There's no pathologic insulin resistance there, um, meaning that your muscles will accept glucose. I wonder why there's not. Once again, it's not pathological, so why are you speaking upon it as if it's something to be fixed and ameliorated? It's not. So if you eat yep. glucose for a few days, you'll start to see that postprandial blood sugar go down and down and down. But the first time that somebody goes back, um, unfortunately, I didn't record this moment in my history, but I'm sure this happened, that after two years of a strict carnivore diet, the first time I took two tablespoons of honey, I'm pretty sure my blood sugar went way high. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Well, that is okay if you do it very, very seldomly. That instance was not indicated for your physiology. I'm sorry. I kept doing it and your body adjusts. All right. Well, that was a little clip from his interview with Thomas Lauer. Just what I expected. Ridiculous, erroneous, fallacious dogma, demagoguery, and a misrepresentation of fundamental rudimentary biochemical principles, including the Randall cycle. If you wanted to learn more about the Randall cycle, once again, I would suggest buying my book, Contraindicated, when it is out. But also, you guys let me know what you think about this. I know that my channel is pretty inchoate right now and pretty small, but to the people that watch to the end of my videos, let me know what you think about this. Probably going to do it anyway. I have plans in the future, potentially in the far future, to record little lessons or courses for the sole purpose of showing its application within human physiology and to diet and lifestyle. I want to do that. I think it's important. Just a thought. But anyway, with that being said, subscribe to the Patreon once again, $1 a month, $5 a month, and $8 a month tier. Please, I really would appreciate the support and you get a lot out of that and you will get even more out of it, especially in the $8 a month tier, once I regain stability and mobility because I have some little projects I would like to produce. So there's that. And also, so 
please refer to the link on the screen now, the Cerule link. If you want more information about what those products are, I once again will refer you to the links in the description below. There will also probably be an icon in the one of the corners of the screen, one of the top corners of the screen, which also has that video in where I elucidated pretty thoroughly what these Cerule products are, what they do, why they're beneficial, who should take it, when you should take it, etc., etc., etc. If you buy through my link and you sign up for monthly deliveries, you get 10% off your first monthly delivery, and I get a very small commission. It's $5 for each person that buys through that link. So I am not trying to gouge people of their money. I'm not rapacious like that. It is genuinely a product that I think will help a lot of people, and I also do not get paid to promote the product, just in case you had any feelings that I do. I do not get paid to promote them. So anyway, follow me on Instagram, Twitter, or X, and TikTok. On TikTok, I've gotten a community strike, which is indicative of the fact that I'm correct in what I say. So before it gets shut down, you can enjoy my content for a little while. Email me at edgoki14 at gmail.com if you have any more questions or if you'd like to recommend that I watch certain videos. I have quite a superfluous supply in my abditory on YouTube. However, I will put aside those to react to ones that I am recommended and cater towards the viewer. So do that if you'd like. I would greatly appreciate that. And I'll get to them as soon as I can and as fast as possible. And with that being said, join me next time when we react to someone else that does not understand a lick, an iota, an inkling of science in any respect, biochemistry, paleoanthropology, statistics and research methods and inferential statistics, comparative anatomy, physiology, physics even, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So see you then.